All right, now we're recording. All right, we have with us the author today of the Copper Scroll, Jim Barfield. I'd like to welcome to, well, welcome him to the Code Searcher. I'm going to be asking him some questions today. If you guys are not familiar with him, he has written the book, The Copper Scroll Project. And, um, well, it's about uh, a treasure map, uh, so to speak, from, uh, is it Baruch and Jeremiah? Is this who we're talking about here? Exactly who we're talking about, and, and about three other prophets at least. <clears throat> they were all involved in this. Wow. Well, Jim, if you don't mind, brother, just, just kind of fill us in on what, what you've been doing and what the Copper Scroll Project is about. Yeah, 13 years ago, uh, in June of 2006, I was introduced to a guy by the name of Bendel Jones. Bendel Jones and I, uh, I had never met him, and it was the strangest thing, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the detail. There was a lady, her name was Miriam Binyako. I was doing a class out of Israel, and I was online and, and speaking to a lady that I thought was in Israel because the, that's where the class originated, was in Bethel. It was on a radio program that I listened to. So I got in there, signed in. And as I, as I signed in and when I, once I entered the room, the lady in the room asked me that she was in charge of the class. <clears throat> Excuse me. She said, she said, Jim, where are you from? And I said, and because of my name, my uh, uh, room name was Jim Apache OK, which meant Jim from Apache, Oklahoma. And I said, well, I'm from, I'm from Apache, Oklahoma. And she said, oh, my goodness. She said, I live in Elgin, Oklahoma. She, I said, Elgin, because that's where I met my wife is in Elgin, Oklahoma. And it's only about 15 miles from here, not even that, 10 miles maybe. And well, she wasn't being accurate. I wasn't being accurate. Long story short, she lived, she lived about two miles from me right now. And we met in a room going through Israel. That was just bizarre. She said she wondered why she kept hearing shofars every Friday night. She kept hearing them when she was getting ready for Shabbat. She was Jewish lady. And I said, that, well, that would be my son-in-law and my son. Because they lived, my son lived one block from her, and she lived about a block and a half from my son-in-law. Now, that is the most unusual, bizarre coincidence. But I'm of the opinion that God has no coincidences in his, in his, with his people. So she introduced me to Vendel. Vendel introduced me to the Copper Scroll, which I'd already read it. I've, I'd been reading the Dead Sea Scrolls for years, and I was wanting to show him some of my timeline research based on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So uh, we then went to his home. He introduced me completely to the Copper Scroll. He was telling me his research, well, his research didn't make sense to me. I mean, I, with all due respect to the guy. Uh, so I thought, you know what, I'll, I'm an investigator. And at the time I was an investigator. Uh, I'd won Oklahoma Investigator of the Year and International Investigator of the Year. So I thought, I'll give it a try. So it was in December of 2006 when I made the discovery. Now, guys, listen to this. I sat down at my table, said my good morning prayers, and, and it was like 5 o'clock in the morning in December. It was at the very, in the very middle, I believe, of Hanukkah. And the date was 1 to vet, which is interesting because it, that, and, and I won't go too deep into this yet, but I, a friend, uh, well, actually, he's not even a friend of mine, an acquaintance, showed up at one of my meetings after I'd figured out the under, how to understand the cover scroll. And he gave me a Bible code that he had ran on my project. And I didn't know very much about the Bible code at the time. I, I was just kind of, I was leery of it because, you know, there were, you guys know that's consonants, no vowels, and you can make hot into hat, hate, you know, name it. You can just go down the list. But once he showed me this Bible code, I was, I was convinced that there was something to it. So um, and I'll go into the Bible code a little bit later and as we get a little further along. But 
what what I have found is I've I've figured out how to understand that copper scroll. Uh, like I said, Vindel got me interested in it, but I applied a very different technique to understand the Copper Scroll. And what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to share my screen with you. Absolutely. Do you know how to do that? <laughs> yeah. Give me just a second. I use Skype. I mean, I use this all the time. Well, very we've good. been using it for about a month, so I'm, I'm still a little shaky on it, but I can do it. So give me just a second. Let me see if I can do this. To hear about more about this code later, um, which is another form of treasure searching, by the way, that what we do. We search for treasure as well, except it's inside the, the script. <laughs> exactly. And that's what it's like. I mean, all of this, because this is, this is not about treasure hunting. Can y'all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. You we can, can or can I? We can. Okay, yes. good. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to hit the button for, uh, I can. Let me see if I can do this. Well, if y'all can see that, okay. I'm just going to go with that. Looks yeah, we good. can see it really good. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna give y'all a disclosure. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that that you guys know enough Hebrew that you'll be able to recognize what I did. And what I did was I, I had, you, you already said the prayer, so I'm going to move over from that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and guys, don't, uh, one thing I have to ask is not to video this portion of the class. Or was y'all wanting to video that? No, I'm just, record, just recording the whole class. Um, but if you need me to pause the, the recording, I could do that. Um, you know what? Go ahead. That's okay. If you want to, if you want to record it just for your own use, that'll be fine. And it's not about, you know, me making money off of this. It's not my intent. My intent is to protect the information, the information you'll see in a minute that the information I'm actually disclosing locations of billions of dollars worth of gold, silver, and gems. So I, I try to protect that to some degree. Okay. Right. So this is this is the guy that actually found the Dead Sea Scrolls back in 1947. Now, if you know anything about uh, biblical timing, that is a very, very incredibly significant date. So, <laughs> so this was this man was the little boy that threw the rock and and found the yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's uh, considerably older then, but yeah, yeah. Uh, he's the kid that threw the rock. And this is actually a picture of the Copper Scroll as it was stacked up inside of cave three. And that, that scroll was actually found by an archeological uh, investigation. That's unusual because usually it was the better ones that found scrolls. The archeologists are pitiful about finding stuff. So Jim, have you worked with the, uh, with the, with the actual copper scroll or with some sort of uh, rep replica or, or etching of it or, or what are we talking about here? That's what I work with. You okay. see it there? Yes. I'll zoom in so you can see it a little closer. This is ancient Hebrew, not Paleo Hebrew. Right. And I'll zoom in a little bit closer here in a minute. But if you'll notice, starting from right to left, it's got 12 columns. And in those 12 columns, the smallest column of all is number 12. Now, number 12 in the in scripture, which tribe was the smallest? If you added the smallest tribe was Benjamin. The youngest and the smallest of all the tribes was Benjamin. And all of these treasures and everything about them is located in the land of Benjamin. Matter of fact, um, where is the Temple Mount located? Which one of the tribes? Do any of you guys know? Wait a minute. I was counting letters when you asked that. Would say that again? What, uh, what tribe uh, is the land allocation that houses the Temple Mount? Yeah, that's a good question. Anybody know who that is? I see Benjamin. Well, Ann, I'm sorry, but you'd be absolutely right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what do I get? Uh, you get you get to wave at the instructor <laughs> of your class. Let's see. Was here, here, here. Were you trying to, here, let me give you a better, if you're trying to do some counting, I was trying to count how many letters in each each column that you have. Uh, how many letters? Well, they the thing about this is there it's written in half 
in handwriting, but it is not, all the letters are of different sizes because there are five different writers on this cover scroll. Yeah. Five different, why would they have five different men writing on the cover scroll? Well, probably for, for um, security, but here's the other thing. We're not talking about, uh, we're talking about a treasure map, so we're not talking about uh, Hebrews who are very meticulous, making the letters look really nice and neat and everything. If you make a mistake, you start over. Uh, they're probably in a hurry at this point, right? Jeremiah exactly. and Baruch trying yep, to get this thing are, done. They, Jeremiah was the teacher of righteousness for for the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of people think that the teacher More of righteousness. But it, well, the only one man, you, they think the only man was the one the teacher of righteousness. Not true. It's it's it was a rotating position. Uh, and and what I learned by doing this copper scroll is there's a lot of information. I can tell you today, there's a lot of information that is going to explode if in fact I've actually found the locations of all this. Now, I'll show you that here in just a second. But you can see this is column number one, two, and three. But look at the difference, look at the difference in the size of the letters. Yeah. See that? It's big, a big difference. <coughs> so you're so telling me Jeremiah was more ascetic? The, the righteous teacher that, that's mentioned. Yeah. Yes. Wow. wow. And what I'm also going to tell you is this is the home of the, uh, the prophets. This is the home of the Melchizedek order. This is where they were housed at. In Qumran. At Qumran. And I'll explain why I know that and how I know that in just a minute. But this is look, these are uh, the four through uh, six, seven through nine, and 10. <laughs> through 12. Now look at the size of the letters that for the guy that wrote the, he started right here. You see where his letters start? Small yep. letters. You can see where he, it's, it's pretty distinct. He, this guy has got uh, all pretty much the same size and then all of a sudden they become tiny. And but this location, this description on this copper scroll is the most valuable and the most potentially explosive location of all. This location, location number three are identical. It's a cave, it's a buried cave and that was written about in uh, second Maccabees. But let's go to the next one now. They've been searching, they found the Copper Scroll in 1952 and they have been trying to figure it out since 1952. And then lo and behold, along comes a retired firefighter from a lot of Oklahoma. And I sat down one day, one morning and actually figured out how to understand this thing. <coughs> I want to get started now on the uh, actual description. You can see, again, if, you, if, if you're pretty proficient with Hebrew, this is ancient Hebrew. This is actually from the Copper Scroll. It's a facsimile, of course. But here's the modern day letters and the spelling, and what it says is under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. Here's how I did it. It's really pretty simple. I took the words and I found the matching letters in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew and to modern Hebrew. And all I did was I went to a Strong's Concordance and every time I found a word, I would take the concordance number and the meaning of that word, See, this is kor korba, which means desolation or destruction. In other words, in the ruins, uh, under the ruins of the Valley of Akor, uh, Akor means uh, destruction or uh, desolation. But watch as we go. The only, <coughs> it says under the ruins in the Valley of Akor, the only ruins that I was aware of or familiar with was Qumran because I'd been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls and very, very excited about doing that. Well, I selected Qumran and I thought, it says under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. I thought I'll, I'll set that, take that particular set of ruins and I will search it. And if the, if the uh, descriptions on the Copper Scroll match up with it, then I'll stay with it till it directs me to go to another set of ruins. Didn't have to. Here's the set of ruins that I used. Let me see if I can extend that a little bit. Wow. Wow. This is actually Qumran. And 
uh, what I did is I took I took a uh, a map of Qum, or actually a, a satellite photograph of Qumran, and I traced it in detail onto this map. So this is a map that I made, and I put in a lot of detail, detail that you won't find on any of the other maps of Qumran. Water system, uh, the the paved areas, the paved areas are in gray, and that's, you know, because I knew they wouldn't be digging in the paved areas and burying stuff in these areas like this strip right here. I can zoom in a little closer. Uh, these are stairways, they're mikvahs, and, yeah. and they're utility pools. So bear that in mind as we go. Let me zoom back out here if I can. Okay. Location number one, are y'all ready to figure out where this is at? Now, the only thing I ask is if you go over there and start digging, that you don't tell them that you learned all this from me. So here we go. I don't think anybody's gonna be doing that. We're <laughs> Didn't think so. Yeah. At the steps extending eastward, 40 cubits are silver service vessels weighing 17 tons. Yeah. Silver service vessels, guys. 17 tons. So let's yeah. see, a talent would be 150 pounds? No, you, you've doubled it. A talent is 75 pounds. 75 pounds, okay. Yeah. However, it'd be great if it was 150 pounds, but in this case, no. So <laughs> you're talking, if you got, <coughs> excuse me, if any of you've got a calculator, you do the math on it. 75 times, uh, you know, 10 is uh, 750 pounds of silver. So that is a, that's a lot of silver vessels to be buried. Well, it says that the steps heading east, there are only one set of head, uh, steps heading east. Now this is north at the top, west is over here, south is here, and the east is here. So there's only one set of steps at Qumran that are heading east. Can any of you guys see that? The steps in the mikvah? Yep, right here. That's the steps. Here's the steps of zoom in on it. And guess what, guys? I did the math on it. I, I just so happened to find a, a document that had just been released by a guy named Yuval Peleg and Yitzhak Magan. Ultimately, those two men would have a meeting with, him, with me about two, about two months after I made the discovery. So let me go further. Here's the actual uh, pool. These steps are heading east, and this is the Dead Sea in the background there. You can barely see it, but that's what that is. Oh yeah. You and this is the area where I presume that the uh, that they buried the uh, valuables because there's no other place around this pool where you could bury. And it said at the steps heading east. So here we are at the steps, and this is the only place that would be large enough to house that much treasure. Location number two, the peristyle. Anybody you know what a peristyle is? Is a peristyle like a like a um, serpentine stair that goes up? No, you're close though. And what it is is an enclosed courtyard. So what it says is this: accommodated in the built mound of the dry cistern is gold in front of the great uh, of the uh, fountain of the great ruined courtyard of the peristyle. Now peristyle, if you look at that. Uh, you guys know your Hebrew well enough, so I'm going to zoom in and see if you can tell me what these Greek words spell, or this, word, this Hebrew letters, what they spell. Right there in the yellow? Yep. Well, it's a phonetic spelling of... Um... Exactly. It's a Greek word. Yeah, it's a it's phonetic spelling of a Greek word. Yep. Ha. Perastelen, the peristyle. Yeah. That's what it is exactly. And, uh, so uh, this is really interesting. So so why would the Hebrews be using a a Greek word but a phonetic spelling of that word? There was there was no uh, Hebrew word at that time that that. Uh, spoke of and described a, an enclosed court. And two, there, I, there's a 
theory out there that the reason they did that is to help throw people off of where this is at. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense with me. I mean, they're telling you where everything's at anyway. <laughs> Why yeah. would you hide one word? So if I, I best, the, I believe that the probability is, or the reason is, is because there was no identifiable word that they could use. But the, in, in Qumran, you were required to know, I believe, three languages, certainly one additional language. Uh, you, that was actually a requirement. They had to be able to speak Greek. Uh, they had to be able to speak Latin. They had to be able to speak Hebrew, obviously. And, and they also spoke Aramaic eventually. Thank so, you. Yes, ma'am. When do you believe that the Copper Scroll was actually written then? Oh, I know. I don't believe. I know that the Copper Scroll was written at the time of Jeremiah, which is First Temple period. That's incredible. What's it like looking at looking at that? I mean, this is this is this is like written wonder archaeology when we're talking about the letters and, and ancient letters, and even going back to Jeremiah. I would just be so starstruck at the fact that I'm looking at something from Jeremiah and his writing on a treasure map than, than the actual treasure itself. I mean, that's the treasure to me is what you're getting from Jeremiah that hasn't been seen for thousands of years. Oh, yeah. And there's still a mystery behind it. It's like, where is this? What did Jeremiah do with it? It's not lost. And it's obviously going to be, I mean, we're talking about the temple. This is something that's prophesied about in the, in the last days. It's going to, these, these things are going to emerge again. We're, we're going to see the Ark of the Covenant and, and you know, the, the actual stuff from the temple. I'm not talking well, about the production stuff that the Temple Institute's making, but actual stuff from the temple. Like, what happened to the, uh, to the altar that was desecrated by Antiochus? That wasn't ever used again. It was stored somewhere, right? Is that a part of the, the Copper Skull findings is the actual stones of that altar? No, they, they, what they've done, that's, uh, that altar, the stone altar was destroyed. They destroyed everything. They destroyed it at the time of the Babylonian captivity, and they destroyed it again at the time <coughs> of the uh, Herodian temple. Wow. But you're right. It's not, it's not the gold and silver that's the treasure. It's not. I mean, you, you guys know that, and I know that. But let me show you how we found them, and I'm telling you, I know where this stuff's at. This is not, uh, I'm kind of guessing, sort of figuring out the words. I know where this stuff is at now. now here, and I'm going to show you where this stuff is at. Are they going to uh, give you credit to it when the uh, Israeli government finally gets its hands on this, uh, on this stuff? Will, will you get credit for, for the actual <clears throat> knowledge? You know, that would be nice. And uh, I've got uh, so much information out there now. This is what you're looking at is copyright protected. Very so good. I have a copyright that was done back in uh, 2007, June of 2007. It was copyrighted. So yes, it is protected. And would I get probably so? And I'll tell you more about that after I after I've got you convinced that I know what I'm talking about. Then I'll tell you more of the details about what's happening now. But what I did as an investigator as I would gather all the information, I wouldn't make any judgments until I have had all the data. Well, each one of these <coughs> locations, and there's 57 of them, I collected the data. And then after I got the data for each location, then I went to the next one, collected all the information with it, went to the next one. And here's what happened. Here is how much gold is that location number two? Oh my gosh. That's 1 billion, 181 million, 250,000. Now gold has gone up and let's see, what has gold gone up to? $1,700 an ounce? Something like that, that's incredible. Yeah, let me, let me do a quick calculation. There's 900 talents times 75 times 14 which is troy ounces times 17, let's say $1,650, because I don't know exactly what it is. No, that is, no, that's not right. Oh my gosh, I forgot to make, turn it in ounces. 
hold on just a second, 75 times 900 equals times 14 equals times $1,650 equals. Yeah, it's now the value of it is one billion five hundred fifty nine million two hundred and seven fifty thousand and times point zero five equals. If they were to pay me the five percent for that one location, my portion of it would be seventy seven seventy eight million dollars right. just for one location. So will they do that? I don't want it, be honest with you, because I didn't do this for money. I did it because I, you know, there was something inside my soul driving me forward with this. But watch now, <clears throat> the information that we're looking for, it said at the courtyard, the Haggadol, the large courtyard, uh, there was a, in the peristyle, this is a peristyle, all the way around it. It's a wall probably eight to 10 feet high and I don't know exactly what it is. I'll show you a better picture of it. This is what the wall looked like around the peristyle at Qumran. This is the main entrance right here. Can y'all see my cursor? Yes, sir. That is the main entrance for Qumran. Guys, this whole place is just packed full of gold, silver, gems, and more importantly, documents. Here's where they buried it, in the courtyard of the peristyle at the fountain. This is incredible that it, all of the details of the description of this is all in, and here's a scan that I did. Oh my goodness. Of Qumran. You can clearly and, see there's something under the ground. Oh gosh, yeah. This is a really <laughs> high dollar, this is a $10,000 metal detector. Well, yeah. you see this spike right here? I passed right by the side of the 900 talents. We didn't scan it. Passed right beside it. Look at the spike on that thing. It's off the charts. The guy that built this com uh, computer system and the, uh, the uh, metal detector was begging me to tell him where this place was at. So this is, so you guys, this is sort of like ground penetrating radar where you get a, uh, you get a feedback. Um, well, this is better. This is better than ground. Ground pinning trading radar hasn't kind of hold a candle to this. Yeah. I'm trying so, to hold a candle. I'm trying to explain to them exactly what we're looking at because that kind of confusing of, of what that is. But um, I, I know about this from being an engineer in the Marines. We did use some, some things looking for it. We would look for explosives, not gold. But we would, yeah. get, we would get a return um, on what's underground. And that, I, not, not even being fluent in searching for precious metals, I can look at that and say, oh my gosh, you've got a, you've got a huge spike there. Oh, Something this is, going on. this thing right here, this is uh, 60 feet long. So and what do the colors stand for? What's the blue, blue is, the blue is, is non-ferrous metals, meaning mm -hmm. gold, silver, brass, it's aluminum. Not it's not iron, in other words. It's right. not the green is iron, but look at it. The green looks like it's two boxes, metal boxes, Probably. sitting there. And so the probability is these are all vessels, by the way. These are all temple vessels. Yeah. That's what was buried there. And this is the 900 talents of gold. How exciting. Now, if those are metal boxes, can this um, thing penetrate to see what's inside? If it is no. a metal box, no, so no, it no. could be something in that yeah. that we just can't see. Oh yeah, probably like an or something. <laughs> there probably other vessels. The vast majority of what we're going to be seeing today are vessels from the temple. So let me show you a little bit more now. Location number three, and I want to show y'all something to give you a little more in depth look into what the what this is all about: the cave, the vessels, and the ephod. Now listen close as I read the next one. It says, in the red heap are wine vessels of the gleaming chamber, the ephod, and the entire tent of tithe the pouring vessels from the treasury. Now, the red heap, I know what it is. It's a, it's a mound there at Qumran, and I'll show you that in a minute. Wine vessels, I know what they are, but what is the gleaming chamber? What are they this talking This is about? really interesting, Jim, um, because the, in the operation of the ephod, 
I, we believe, and, and, and I've got this information from um, different lecturers and, and um, Jewish historians and things like that, that ephod actually operated by reflection. Like the fire from the altar would reflect off of the, the jewel, which had a, you know etching of the names, also on top of the, the shoulders, that um, with the, this fire interaction with fire and the, the high priest standing there, that letters would appear on um, the wall. And this is how it was used to communicate. The ephod is a communication device, by the way. It's not, it's not, it's not the high priest blinging, right? That's it. It had a function to it. Yes, it did. Well, we know what the vessels are, but what is the gleaming chamber? I'm just guessing on that, right? What would you think? Gleaming chamber. Well, what is the ephod? You know right, what that right. is. The, the ephod, we think, is a, is a communication device. It, could the gle gleaming chamber be the um, Ark of the Covenant or no? You're very, very close. The gleaming chamber is the inside of the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. Because why would it be gleaming? It's because the inside walls of that tabernacle or temples was completely coated with polished gold. So you had a room of golden mirrors. So wow. you light one candle in that, in that uh, room of mirrors and it completely turns into a gleaming chamber. But if you, put the, uh, if you put the menorah, if you put the Ark, the Covenant, and it's got this Shekinah glory, it explodes into a gleaming chamber. Yeah. So the, you were entering into a gleaming chamber whenever you went into the temple. Have, have, you, have you ever seen One Night with the King, uh, the story of Esther and the Persian? Uh, yeah, I have actually. She holds, up a, she holds up a jewel at some point and shines a candle through it. And it's the Jewish star kind of kind of shines all over the wall when she's standing. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. That's very similar to what I'm talking about with the, with the operation of the ephod, with the letters that light penetrated those letters and letters, uh, excuse me, penetrated the stones and letters would, would illuminate. Um, this is my, you know, when you say gleaming chamber, this is what I'm seeing because um, this is how we believe that the, the ephod operated in the first place was light, penetrating light through the, the stones and reflections. Oh, that's good. That is very good. Wow. Well, the red heap, let me show you how I found it. Here's a map of Qumran and this is, this is during the springtime. And this was many years ago. They haven't had a rain, uh, significant rains, uh, in at least 13 years because I've been going over there all these years. And it only recently started raining. The, the Galilee is almost full. Now, that's, it's been years since that Galilee's been full. And that's part of their prophecies in Israel. Well, I want you to look at this map and see if you can see a significant looking hill or heap or mound on that picture anywhere. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Oh yeah, we see it. That's it right there. This is a here recent, recently taken. And this is the uh, spot that they're, that where we're talking about where all this stuff is hidden at. And I'll explain that to you in just a few minutes. There's my buddy, Chris Knight. He's number two on the project. And that was where we believe the opening to this particular cave is at. The vessels, these are the kind of vessels that they're talking about. This is actually from the Temple Institute. The gleaming chamber, that's what we're talking about, guys. That's looking into the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Wow. So you see why it would be a gleaming chamber. You have the, the, the uh, menorah, you have uh, the, the Shekinah glory from above the seat at the altar of incense. Now listen to this. Here's the, <coughs> here's a, what I think is one of the, the most significant. This is what the ephod looked like. There's the, it's like you were talking about the stones on the shoulders. And here is the ephod. This is made according to the biblical standards. But I want to show you something even more interesting and significant. Here's location number one, location number two, and location number three. Look at that. They're in a straight line. But this, then when would you get to the last five, location number 53 is here, 54, 55, 
56 and 57. What are they doing? They lined them in a straight line so you could make sure and find this cave. This cave has got the most important and significant items inside of it. It's incredible what's inside of that cave. But now I want to show you something else. Let's go one step further. Here is the dub. This one, whenever I show this location to anybody, uh, whenever I was uh, disclosing my information to Shuka Dorfman, the head of the Antiquities Authority, <coughs> Miriam Benyaka <coughs> introduced me to, to uh, Bendel Joan. Well, a lady that works at a Comanche Nation college here in Lawton, Oklahoma, was best friends, listen to this, she was best friends with the guy that was the head of the Antiquities Authority of Israel. And I was working at that location, uh, teaching the investigative report writing. And she found out about my project and she pull, pulled me in her office. She said, Jimmy, I think I can help you with your project. Now you gotta understand that this is a little Comanche lady from Oklahoma. I thought, how would a Comanche nation, a Native American Indian know the head of the Antiquities Authority of Israel? She did. He was here at Fort Sill, which is a military artillery base. He was an artillery commander, a general in the Israeli army. He came here for training and her and her husband, who was Jewish, uh, they hosted and, and they, they were companions to their entire family while they were here at Fort Sill for several months and they became the best of friends. She called him and said, you need to listen to this guy. He's got some important stuff for you to look at. He set up a meeting two weeks later. I am in Israel talking to this guy face to face. Now, how does that happen? Again, I don't think there are any coincidences. Here's the, here's the uh, one we're looking at now, the double entry pool. Here's what I look for as an investigator. Double entry pool, the entrance at the north edge of the community. The pool has to be six cubits, one side of it. <coughs> the pool is what has to be white. It's a pool of oblation or for purification. The pool has to rise from the soil. It goes down and to the left when you enter it. There has to be a place for mire or mud. And the mire has to, it has to be the highest place uh, above the mud at that location. Watch guys. Here's the location. This is the absolute north end of the community. You have to go down and to the left to enter it. The pool was completely white at the time. It's kind of a dingy, kind of a brownish color, light brown color now. But all of the clues, this pool, this uh, wall right here where it's buried is exactly six cubits long like it's supposed to be. Here it is. Well, they've, re they've restored it. Here it is now. They've restored it, but the colors don't last long because of the mud or the dust now. Back then, there was a, a much more water. This entire side here was white, and I think I may have a picture of it after they replastered it. But from here to here, a little bit better on this side, from this location of the wall to here is exactly six cubits long, just like all the details have told you. Now, as an investigator, I had to figure out whether or not this was actually a mikvah or a ritual bath. Well, during my deep investigation, as I was walking around the pool, I found this big sign that says ritual bath. You see that? So you see how good my investigative skills are. I figured it right out right away. Now, guys, look at this. This is Qumran. This is Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah. Do you oh. see the... the uh, correlation absolutely and here are the, very similar oh <laughs> my gosh these are the names of the location as they're described on the copper scroll this is here's the fountain oh hold on just a second let me hang this up i'll answer this guy later this is the the fountain this is the fountain gate of jerusalem this is the pool of siloam this is the uh, mikvah at, at uh, Qumran, and it's a double entry mikvah. But do you see that a lot of miracles took place at the pool of Siloam, didn't they? 
Well, that's what they've done is they recreated Jerusalem in the wilderness. This is a water system in Jerusalem, water system at Qumran, the high priest fountain. This is the uh, Eastern water gate, the Royal palace. This is where the Zadok was at. This room represented the temple. This is where the temple's at. And guess what? This red dot, that is the, the column of Boaz at Qumran. What did they set uh, outside the uh, temple in Jerusalem? Two columns. One was the column of who? Yaquin, and the other one was the column of Boaz. Mm. You see that? Here's the ram's pen and the sheep's pen. Here's the sheep's gate, sheep pool, woman's gate, woman's tower, woman's house. These are all the watchtowers at uh, Qumran. Uh, these are all the watchtowers in Jerusalem. Now, guys, is that a coincidence? I promise you it is not. So it, that, that's not a mirror image, then. That's a, a straight-on image. Well, it's a mirror image because if you flip this upside down, the Qumran, this is north, and this is south. You oh, see what happens? I see now. Okay. So it becomes a mirror image if you do it that way. But either way, no matter how, how you look at it, this is a mirror image or it's, in, it's almost an exact duplicate of this. This is actually oblong, a little bit elongated just because of the way it came out whenever I put it on, the, uh, on this image. <coughs> it's actually more squished and just like this. So here is the mik uh, mikvah at Jerusalem. This is a, a miniature Jerusalem in uh, right next to the, uh, the Israeli Museum. And if you'll notice, it's got two entries, one here, one over here. So you got entryway and an exit. This is the Pool of Siloam. And look at that water system that runs right by it and runs up to the temple. Let me go back one. Here is a water system, and it runs. This is it runs opposite. From here, the water runs into Jerusalem, and it actually extends further. This one is where the water runs out. So the water comes from the Temple Mount, and it runs down and runs out here at the Fountain Gate. Hey, so, Jim. Yes. They had two different places they believed were the Pool of Siloam for many years. It was the one location, then they found the other one further down in the city of David. So which one do you believe is the actual Pool of Siloam? Oh, I've been to it several times. And me too. <laughs> that's that's why the, I'm curious. Yeah, that's the one I'm, I'm sure that that's it. Because mm -hmm. you, water can't run uphill. It has to run downhill. So that's where I believe that the... Uh, the uh, that pool is at. That pool is fed by the water from the temple. Now people think there's a guy out there that believes that the, uh, that the temple was down here. Guys, it, it, it makes no sense. And with all due respect to him, uh, and I've even got a modern day map now that, uh, of an ancient, uh, an ancient map of a modern location. You see that? That's where the guys at Qumran built the temple, the, the match for the temple. It's where the temple is actually at. See that? Let me turn this little fellow down. It's one of my neighbor kids. And I don't have time right now. So anyway, again, another picture. That's a double entry mikvah. And this, it looks like, it looks like a, uh, see this? It looks like a flat wall there. It's not the way it was. There, was, there are steps that lead down into it. Um, there's a video that they did uh, about two, three years ago. They were wanting to do a TV series about the Copper Scroll Project. And they did a pilot. And we were actually at this location when we filmed some of it. Okay. I am going to pause right here and See if I'm starting to get any of you convinced that this is actually the locations of the treasures of the Copper Scroll. Um, what do you? What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, you guys got. I'm Jonathan. Do you guys have any questions for for Jim? 
Well, it's a lot of amazing information. <laughs> I can't wait to uh, like look at the words a little more that you have on there, you know, the Hebrew. Okay. Yeah. What I could do is I'll, I'll email it uh, to Ann and, and Ann could share it with you guys. How about that? That'd be great to study. Yeah. And if you know the ancient Hebrew, uh, if you don't know the ancient Hebrew, <laughs> it's a little more difficult. And these are not evenly spaced. You know, it's, it's not like the computer version of the Torah. It's uh, these, I'll show you the images again of the, uh, the words. You, there, it's hard to determine where a word ends and where a word begins, but it, it certainly can be done. Uh, I mean, I was able to do it, so I'm, I'm sure you guys would be able to figure out as well. Any other questions? Jim, could you go over some of the letters that are a little bit more uh, difficult to decipher? Um, well, well, we could start just about anywhere. Uh, like on this one, this is where it says, under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. Uh, can you see the word under in there? The word is techat. Do you see that on the first line anywhere? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. It's right close to the number two. Nope. No? It's, it's in, a, in a large word there. Hold on a second. Um, in the first line, you got to go to the first line. Right. Remember, it reads from right to left. So, right there? That's it. Tachat. So that is that is how this all worked out, guys. And you can you can find every word in there that I just told you about under the ruins of the Valley of Kor, of course, in Hebrew. So bear that in mind whenever I send this to you. You can see where they made mistakes. They actually, whenever they made this copper scroll, they tacked it into uh, a thin sheet of copper, three sheets of copper. And then they riveted those three sheets together. Well, when they tried to roll them up, it broke. Uh, and it, what happened was they had people that they call it the copper scrolls, when in fact, it's really one scroll that is broken in two. So bear that in mind. And again, here's the, here's the entire scroll. Well, right in here, well, I, I erased them. So I just, there were rivets. I think you, I might have left some of them right here. See those circles right here? Yeah. That, those were rivets. Uh, and they riveted these three sheets together. I think it ended here and it ended here. So then they riveted all three of them together. Well, that's, like I said, it's really just one scroll. It's not copper scrolls, plural. Again, here's the first page. And if you'll notice, uh, there's here's your word to God. I have a question. If you take that first page and you go down to the sixth row, the very last letter, which looks like a little steer with horns, mm -hmm. do you know what letter that is? Okay, the sixth one, row down. two, three, four, five, six, all the way over. Uh -huh. Those are two letters actually. Okay, that's that is Zadi and Dalit. Oh, okay. That's where the, let me zoom in a little bit. That's why it makes it difficult when you're doing this. And what, what letter is this? That's a shin. That's it. It's a shin. But it's hard to tell that because it doesn't look uh, as much like a modern day shin that as, as the, of course, the modern name. What about this one? What letter is this one? Yeah, that's a good question. Is Olaf? Is it an Olaf? Yep, Aleph. And then let's look at this letter right here. Is that a Lamed? It's a Lamed, but it has a Vav right next to it, or Yod right next to it. You would miss that if you didn't. That, yeah. Wow. So once you start learning this, uh, you, you start picking it up much easier. Uh, there, there's an Ayan, <coughs> there's a Bait, Lamed's in us. See this Lamed? 
looks more like Lamed we have today than this one does. But, but if you know that, and you look at this Lamed and you know that it's supposed to look like this, then yeah. you realize, oh, there's another letter right next to right. it. Right, you can see, you can see that like right here, he almost did it again in his, uh, and imagine guys, they're impressing on copper. They're not writing with E. So they're, they're actually making the, the, uh, the impression of the letter with, with tapping and a, some sort of tool, right? Right, like a tiny chisel. Yeah, so um, he almost did that again here with the Lamed Bob and they almost join like it is here to where it looks like one letter, which could be yeah. so cool. if you're trying to, if you're trying to uh, decipher this, you're like, what is he doing? That's, that's another letter. I don't think that's what he's wrong with. No, it's two letters. Let me give you another, it's a, for, for those of you that, uh, that haven't studied the Dead Sea Scrolls, let me give you a little tip. In, in the time of Yeshua, in the time of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is actually, this was written in Jeremiah's time frame. But remember this, that they would end, whenever you end a, whenever you end a word, you have a final noon, you have a, you know the deal. <coughs> well, uh, in, in Hebrew, when in the ancient Hebrew, whenever they would end a word, they didn't end it a plural word with yod mem. You know what they ended it with? They ended it with a yod noon. So if you have a nazir, you know what nazir is? Yeah, and then it would be nazim. Nazarene. Wow. Nazarene. So whenever they, whenever they call Yeshua a Nazarene, guys, it's way more, and Nazareth didn't even exist at that time. It was a village, but it wasn't, it wasn't called Nazareth. Hey, guys, what it what what they're saying is the Nazarenes. What is a Nazarene? What is a Nazir? First of all, it's a yeah. sect that yeah. Well, um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a particular sect. They took they took vows of uh, coming like, from the Nebzer, right? Yeah, the Nazarite people. They, people don't know and don't realize Yeshua was Nazir. Yeah, that's why he's got all the pictures with the long hair. He's always Samson. Uh, Samson's another yeah. one. Samson, Samuel, John the Baptist, all of them were Nazarites. And that's what I'm telling you. Now, listen to me. In the book of the Revelation, it says that they're going to take 12,000 <coughs> from each tribe, and they're going to be, uh, you know what, let me, let me end this. Let me bring this down. Nazir. Like to be able to see you guys. Uh, let's see. Does Nazir mean branch? N really, what Nazir is a is a uh, uh, separated and holy, made holy Set to the apart. Lord. Set apart to the Lord. That's exactly right. Let me see if I can. Oh, give me just one second. My great grandmother used to call me Samson when I was a baby, guys. When I was like four years old, because my mom let my hair grow out till I was five. Um, and my grandmother would call me Little Samson. Wow. <laughs> well, so the Nazir has a Zion in it, and the Natsar is a Zadi. And those are two different words, from my understanding. Nazir has a Nazir has a Zadi. Yeah, but the Nazir that's found in number six, that's a Zion. Uh, I'm not real sure what you're talking about, to be honest with you. Okay, so two different, two different spellings, two different words, two different meanings. The Natsar would be like the branch and the watchman. Yes, Nebzer. okay, now I know what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. whenever it's referring to branch, you're correct. But Nazir, uh, Nazir is, a, is about, you know, in, he, listen to this. In the book of the Revelation, it talks about the 12,000. 12,000 from each tribe. And they would become a nation of priests. That is a priesthood, guys. How do you become a priest if you're a Benjamite? How do you become a priest if you're Zebulun? The way you do that is all the firstborns, all the firstborns, male or female, it can become Nazir. Whenever you become Nazir, you, and they even argue about it in the Talmud, who is more holy? 
is it the Nazarite or the high priest? Now they're comparing it to the high priest, not just to any priest. You see what I'm saying? That is, that is something incredibly significant because how would Yeshua be a priest if he's from the tribe of Jer uh, Judah. Judah? How does that happen, guys? There's only one way. That is whenever you become Nazir. You become holy to the Lord, and you become a priest. That's how we're going to, and that's what's going to happen, is they're going to recreate what is called the Melchizedek order. And when Yeshua comes back, they're recreating the Melchizedek order because they were always supposed to have been priests, an entire nation of priests, not just, uh, just the Levites. Think about that. How did that happen? And in the, the Nazir, to become Nazir is very important. Uh, young, it's supposed to be every firstborn male that exits a womb. Uh, what about you, sir? Are you uh, firstborn? Yeah, Jonathan is firstborn, and I'm firstborn as well. I'm his wife, Darla. I that, am too. That is not a coincidence. When I teach, I go to a group of, uh, especially uh, if they're Messianic or in any group that is really intensely studying and they got a large group, every single time I always ask, ladies and gentlemen in this room, male and female, would you please raise your hand if you are first born? And the room fills up with arms as I reach into the sky. That's that, fascinating. Wow. That, the job of the firstborn is to carry on. That's why he's given, she's given a double portion. Guys, this is not, and I'm telling you, this is something that is incredibly important to all of us is to recognize that because the, the, the book of the Revelation is talking about the restoration of the Melchizedek order. And the, to be the Melchizedek, does not mean that there was one guy at the time of uh, uh, Abraham that was Melchizedek. Everybody, I hear a lot of the people say, oh, well, that was Jesus. He was, no, it wasn't Yeshua. It was Shem. Shem was the first, uh, uh, was the Melchizedek that was receiving the tithes from Abraham. Shem, son of Noah? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Now think about that. Abraham, Noah was the Melchizedek until he came through the flood because there's nobody left. So there had to have been a Melchizedek to take his place. And that was the firstborn. Whenever you look at the scripture, who was born first? Shem, Ham, Japheth. That was the order that they were born in. See what's happening? Yeah. Shem takes his role as the, as the ruling and reigning Melchizedek at that point now. Let me show you something else, and then I won't, I won't keep you guys any, any longer. Can we see first how many of us are all firstborns? <laughs> sure. This is all amazing. Firstborn, firstborn here. Firstborn. Firstborn. Yeah. Firstborn. Same here. Here. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty incredible, guys. <laughs> uh, we're, we're a little weird. Uh, we're firstborn from our, my mother with her. Uh, it, his name was Dalwood, and we were, he had other, but we were the first twins of that union. And because of the, the C-section, I popped out first, even though I should have been last. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah, well, I'm so great. And they were both kind of first. <laughs> so. No, you were firstborn. Yeah. I'm firstborn oh. also. <laughs> is there anyone in the room that is not firstborn? And. And. And you got to go. This is a special yeah. plan. <laughs> I'm hey. the first girl. I'm the first girl in the family. Hey, that counts. <laughs> well, there you go. No, I'll claim. I'll claim the birthright of Joseph, uh, who was not <laughs> not first. Well, I guess he was first from his mama, but um, yes, he was. You know, first. I have two first. brothers ahead of me, and one. Brother. I'm number four in my family. Number four. Hey, yeah, and I'm the daughter of the seventh child my dad was the seventh child of his parents oh wow oh, seventh, oh, seventh hey. child of a seventh uh, child that's interesting well that you see what i'm talking about this is not uncommon i'm telling you whenever i asked and i teach a class i did this the other day with a christian group in uh 
where was it at? In California, anyway. And the majority of the people in that room were firstborns. They they are the most eager to learn. It's because that's their responsibility. God laid that responsibility on them. So, and, and that's why the, the vow of the Nazarite, if you'll notice it, that vow of the Nazarite is for male, female, slave, you know, firstborn in the, it's, that's a vow that you take to separate yourself to God and you take on uh, that responsibility. So, a matter of fact, whenever I was uh, made this discovery, I was Nazir. I had been Nazir for uh, well over, or right at a year at that point. So I had become Nazir, and that's when I made this discovery. Wow. So you can't drink wine. You can't be, I didn't get to go to my dad's funeral. Uh, just a lot of things happened during that time. Frame. So it was during the time you were a Nazirite that you came into this revelation. Yes. About the Copper Scroll. Wow. Yes. Well, I did a Nazarite vow way back in 2005 before I knew anybody else that had ever done it outside of biblical characters. Uh -huh. um, I was just studying it in, in the Minor Prophets and I thought, I can do this. There's only three restrictions and I don't have to fast. <laughs> so I did it for 30 days, but that was before I ever came into the Torah ways. And how, how did you come into the, the ways of Torah, Jim? Oh, that's, that's real easy. I was studying the, I was studying the story of Samson and, uh, we were doing a fast. I was going to a charismatic church at the time, but I was studying, and this was years and years ago, but we were studying, uh, me and my wife and kids, we were studying the story of Samson. Laurie, my wife was listening to a guy by the name of Joseph Good. Have y'all get, y'all ever heard of him? No. Yeah, I haven't. Joe Good is an absolute scholar on temple. I'm telling you, I've never met anyone that had more knowledge about the temple than Joseph Good. He's just an amazing, wonderful, humble man. And I was, I was, she was listening to him, and I was studying Samson. And I was, I called her one night. I made the connection. I thought, Laurie, look this Nazarite thing, this, this is not Jesus, the Nazarene, this is Jesus, the Nazarite. And I was telling her this, the old Testament is just as good today as it, as it was at the time of Yeshua and it's, and it's life. And, and she said, she said, that's what I see too. She said, Jimmy, I think we're supposed to be doing the feast, the, the, and I said, I do too. And it's just me and her. I came home and we sat down and we, we came to the conclusion we're either crazy or how did these preachers miss this? So that's when it began. They're still blind today, brother. Even when you try to tell them and you try to explain to them on a rudimentary level, brother, the eyes glaze over and they yeah. get like stuck in headlights like a deer. Like what yeah. are you talking about? Don't take away well, my Easter. Don't take away my Christmas. Oh, oh my gosh. I did a two hour radio show out of California, uh, San Diego, California. And I told them, I said, guys, this Easter stuff, that's gone. When you sure gets back, it's gone. Christmas gone. And, and, and the guy that was, you know, running the radio show, he was yeehaw me. He had wanted to say this, say the same stuff. <laughs> he was excited. Yes. That's what I believe too. So it's happening all over the world. I got a call from New Zealand and <laughs> they wanted to talk to me. And we had the same kind of deal we're doing here today. And they were so excited because we were on the same sheet of music. Everything we were talking about, they were with us. It's happening yeah, all and, over and the world. When you see universal like that, like, yeah. a, like, a, like a wave sweeping the, the planet, guy, that's the Holy Spirit moving on people. That's how you know the awakenings happen. People yeah. on the other side of the planet, planet saying, what do I have to do with idol work? Just like Ephraim. Ephraim will say, what do I have to do with idols anymore? I'm done with it. That's it. And it's time for us to recognize idols in our life. Let me give you, you know what the, the, the most popular God is today? 
What is Especially that? Especially in Oklahoma. I'm a little worried to ask. Money. I would say football. Gambling. I would say cell phone selfies. Well, I'm with the lady that says it, it is the ancient god, Baal. Yes. Gambling. I mean, money. Football, no, wait. Football, basketball, baseball. That's the biggest <laughs> dog of all. Oh, I'm you football. Interesting. <laughs> It, I mean, think about it. You know? they've, got, they've got enormous uh, ceremonial stadiums built for them. Yes. Brother, that is it, very, very deep. Yes, it is. Very it is deep. absolutely true. And very I am not a, a – I love to go to my grandkids' baseball games, that sort of stuff, but they're kids and they're playing and they're having fun. That's fine. But whenever it becomes – kids. They, yeah. Everybody gives up everything. For football, especially, they just, it is just over the top. And I tell people, you know, guys, you, may, you ain't gonna like this, but I'm telling you, you are worshiping the Baals. Yep. You know what Baal means, I'm sure. It yep. means the master. Yeah, the master of your life. And their football games are the masters of their life. Is it Jeremiah and, 10? Is it Jeremiah 10 where it says your fathers will say we've inherited vanities? Um, where you, you changed my name to Ball, he says. Mm. Oh my gosh! And they I think have. it's Jeremiah ten where where <laughs> he says you changed my name to Baal, and people will read that and be like, "When did we do that?" Well, you call him Lord every day, and you say, "Lord, Lord, Lord, Lord," right? That's Ball. Baal okay. is Lord. I want you guys to keep doing what you're doing, keep spreading the word because we're th we're here. It's not, it's not long, no longer is it, uh, you know, that he will soon return. He's here. I mean, the, the, the time has come. The prophecies are being fulfilled. I, let me show you one other thing, and then I'll, I'll shut up. But I got to show you guys this. Um, let me see if I can do this. You see that? Are you there? Yes. Can y'all see this? We see. Yes. What is it? What is it you see? Uh, looks like a spreadsheet for some sort of um, timeline. That's exactly what this is. I do timeline research as well. Let me show you something. I'm, I'm going to show you how significant. Uh, what I did is I plugged in biblical dating only for the main structure of this timeline. Look, Ezekiel, he said that he would lay on one side for 390 days for, and that represented the punishment of Israel. Yes. Then he said, I will lay on the other side for 40 days, which represents the punishment of Judah. Yeah. Well, in Leviticus, it says that seven your punishment will be multiplied by seven right. if you do not if you do not repent. Well, Jeroboam, from the date that Jeroboam died, I plugged in seven times three hundred and ninety, and look where it came to. It it's came the year to we woke up right here, <laughs> the year nineteen forty seven. Seven times, right here, seven times three hundred and ninety. And it landed exactly on the year 1947. Now, let me give you another one. In the Israel. year, look at this. The Daniel from the, uh, from the laying of the cornerstone, the second for the second temple, it was exactly through 2,300 years as it's prescribed in Daniel, and it lands again 1947. It goes on and on. I could, I could show you prophecy after prophecy uh, that is fulfilled, but you have to use biblical dating. Don't listen to these. So, uh, so we're talking about 2,800 years ago or so, roughly, for Jeremiah, right? Yes. Well, it was uh, about 2,400 years ago. Okay. Because in our, my calculation, because we were calculating Jeremiah's, um, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel's curse, for the northern tribes, and we came up with um, 2,730 years is the end of the, and this is including the seven 
times iniquity. That bring us to 2009, 2010, when the curse is over. Well, let me show you something. Here is, uh, I put all of the uh, sabbatical years in here. Here is the, the uh, this date is, let me see. That's the current Jewish dating. This is the actual dating from Adam on this column here. This is Jewish dating. This is modern day. Uh, Bulgarian. CD, yeah, this is uh, AD, Anno Domini. These are the sabbatical years. I've got them all plugged in here. And the Jubilee years, I've got them all plugged in here. <coughs> well, look. If you go, if you go to this time frame, this is the the jubilee that we're in. This pink one, this is our jubilee. We are right. Excuse me. Here is uh, 2020 right here. Listen to this. Adam, he was born in a jubilee year. The jubilee that he was in, you go exactly 40 jubilees from Adam. You come to Isaac. Isaac was offered as a sacrifice on the same hill with the same uh, sticks on his shoulders and offered it the same way he was offered as a whole burnt offering. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. You go 40 Jubilees from that point, you come to the time of Yeshua. Exactly. 40 Jubilees from that date to Yeshua, it was, he, Yeshua was crucified in a Jubilee year. Did you know that? Yes, because at Isaiah's, listen, when he there comes into go. the temple and he says, and he reads a parcel of a scroll, and he stops at a particular point. He is indicating to you, this is the year that the caps are, caps are going to be let, set free. What is that, that guys, it, when the captives are let free? It's Jubilee. He was declaring the Jubilee. Jubilee. That's really awesome. I've never heard anybody say that, Jim, other than you. Well, we came to this conclusion from calculation and from codes and things like that, but we've never heard, I've never heard anybody say Yes, Yeshua it's a, it was a jubilee year. Now, they, now listen to this. 40 jubilees from Yeshua, the crucifixion of Yeshua to today, every special jubilee cycle had a messianic figure in it. Adam, Isaac, Yeshua. Now, if they sent messianic figures during that time frame, there we are now in that same jubilee cycle. Right now, we're in it. And we are right here, 2020. And if they sent, if the father sent a messianic figure every time, I would think that he's going to send another one since we are at the 6,000th year. We are, we are past the 6,000th year. We have already entered, entered into the thousand year time of rest and we're late. You don't want to be late for Shabbat. You can be early, but you don't want to be late because God gets not happy about that. So, so 120 jubilees since Adam. <coughs> since Adam, 123 jubilees. 123 yes. jubilees. Yep. Wow. Hey, Jim? Yes. Do you happen, do you use the book of jubilees at all for the time frames well, like you have look, on the far left or no? Hold on just a second. It's, it's like there's a, this, it, something doesn't line up with the, with the uh, book of jubilees and, and what we're counting. Let me show you something. I don't know. I haven't figured out why that is because I do believe Jubilees is a, it, well, it's a book about counting the Jubilees. It's a, it's a historical record, but something's a little off there. I, I, I've discovered. Here's the book of Jubilees right here. The book of Jubilees says this, and watch me on this. It said, in the fourth year of the fifth week of the third cycle, that it had to be the third cycle, the fourth year of the fifth week. Yeah. Look, here is the first week, second week, third week, fourth week, fifth week. Look, fifth week, the middle of the fifth week. Fourth year, exactly, is when Seth would be born. You see that? Yes. So the Jubilees are correct, at least to this point, but you can't count Jubilees by uh, 50 and then another start another 50 it doesn't work it has to be on a base of seven because the sabbaticals are on the base of seven otherwise it would be completely screwed up after the third this is a the fifth week look 
how far off it is. This is a 50 year count right here. You're two years off. You go further, you're three years or four years off. It you compounds. go further. Year by year, it compounds. Years. They have to be, you have to do it on a seven year cycle. What happens is this. After the 49th year, you come to the 50th year. See here? You come to the 50th year and the first year are the exact same year. There, there's never an end to the, the, the Hebrew cycles. They're cycles. They're not linear dating. They're cycles, which means it's con, uh, continuous, never ending. So whoever asked that about the Jubilees, that's right. They, they, are, they are true and correct in the first cycles, but for some reason, I'm with uh, Jonathan, they, are, they get off as you get further and further down the cycle. I don't know why. But they Jim, are the Jewish scholars even admit this, uh, Jim. It's the most bizarre thing. They believe that they're about, uh, they differ. They say 230 to 250 years off in their calendar. Oh. The yeah, Jewish let me show you. Um, a, Can I just ask then, are you saying that 5780 is actually a Jubilee this year that we just started? No. I can, what I can show, I'll show you that in just a second. Okay. Here, let me, let me do this. A6000. Jim, That's, you do all uh, this calculating and all this uh, putting together this, uh, this spreadsheet? Yeah. This is incredible, brother. This is right up our alley. We, we, we are, we got an interest in this kind of stuff. Um, well, you can't, you can't time don't lines. use anything secular. Yeah. Is this something you can get off the internet or is this private? Uh, it's private, but I'll send it to you guys. <laughs> oh, yay, because I really want a copy. Yeah, I would love to. Look you. Thank you. Here. Yes, awesome. please. Well, um, we'll promise to keep it in-house, Jim, and um, if, if it's ever used for teaching purposes, make sure that, that, that it's, uh, you're giving credit for the, for the data here. Um, well, thank we just, you. Here, here's we, have, what I want. Uh, we have an appetite for, for you know, stuff like this uh, in this group. What this is, I'll tell you what, I will give you a, a copy of this, of my most current copy. I'll give you a copy of it uh, if you will let me come back and show you how to operate it. Apple, absolutely, brother. We, we'd love to have you as you know, an honorary guest of this group. Oh, uh, That's you're awesome. A, you're, uh, <laughs> he's another type of code searcher, folks. Yes, um, absolutely. We, we look at code searching as like a, a biblical form of archaeology type of um forensic because um the misconception on, on the mainstream is well the, the codes aren't really accurate for predicting the future now michael grosen did a lot of damage on this respect because i don't teach that that he gave us a crystal ball the future is contained but it's not just laying there on the surface that you can go just pick it up and go make a prediction right the reason the codes are there is for us to reconcile his word he gives us the answers encoded Right, a very good, a perfect example is Isaiah 53. On the surface, when you read that, everybody has an opinion of who that is. Even the Jews say, "Oh, that's the nation of Israel." Wrong, because the encoded text says, "My great name is Yeshua." That's <laughs> how we know that Ramsel method is right. Yaakov Ramsel was 100% right that the encoded text verifies the the plain text. In other words. We don't yeah. have an opinion on what any given line of scripture means. In other words, this theologian, that theologian, and a thousand different opinions you get that, that brings confusion. He has made a way intrinsically that we can know what he means. And I'm, I'm sure of it. So that's what we focus on, brother. We don't look for like predicting the future, but we do try to reconcile his word because you're and the Satan loves it. He loves that there's so much confusion. And when you start getting to the truth, he gets he gets starting to get worried, right? We see that in people's faces when yeah. we bring them some truth. Like, there you go. Uh, like, how did they get out of that? It, I don't know, but we're going. I'm going to give this lady her answer, and then I'm then we'll let you guys ask some more questions. Then I'll get out of y'all's way so y'all can study. Here, the jubilees are marked right here. Uh, every there's a yellow line right here another there's all the jubilees yeah the jubilees are all marked and it is if you trust the bible if you trust scripture then you could anybody could have done this 
my son-in-law who is, uh, does accountant work, he did it. I just told him what to do. And he came with the exact same datings I did. He was off one year, which is easy to do. And, but I told him like a father-in-law should, I said, well, you'll figure out your mistakes soon enough. And, and uh, he, he laughed at me and he was excited. His, my point is that this is not something that is a complicated, it's not, it's just, you got to trust scripture. But look, the Jubilee, the last Jubilee cycle was on the same, on the same schedule as the one that Yeshua proclaimed at the synagogue was 1991. That's when the Jubilee year was. However, my Jewish brothers in Israel proclaimed a Jubilee in the year 2016. You see that right here, right there. They claimed the Jubilee year, which is incredible that they would do that because there's always two calendars running. There is a Jubilee calendar or a, a civil calendar and a religious calendar. Did you hear what I said? Yes. There's a Jubilee cycle or, or the, for the Yeshua was on was the, uh, was the uh, civil calendar. The one that the Jews are proclaiming today with great respect to them is the religious calendar. The religious calendar uh, is, is, starts exactly midway in the cycle and how they did that, whether they know this or not, they did it exactly right because 1991, the exact center of it is right there. They started the Jubilee cycles again and every single temple that, uh, that God has prescribed, that cornerstone was always laid 10 years after the Jubilee. You see that? Well, they didn't lay a corner, a cornerstone uh, they laid a cornerstone, Gershon Solomon did, exactly at the right time, 10 years after this jubilee, but there was no temple built. I think that's probably because 10 years after this jubilee that they had recently proclaimed is right here. Let me just do a count for you so you can see it. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In the year 2026, will that be the year that the cornerstone for the temple is laid? I don't know, but we're commanded to search, to try to understand and look. So you look in I, the third table. Ta uh, okay, so looking up the third temple ta table, we can look up that year and see if there's any uh, close proximity or any anomalies that that um, lead us to believe that this is a significant year. Um, and that's not predicting the future or anything like that, guys. It is looking at the data. I, have, I don't it. have a, for, a horse in the race, so I don't care if it's right. yay or nay. It is what it is. And that's, that's the thing about codes is you can't have a dog in the race. You can't have an opinion about it. The data reflects the, what, what the data says. So, um, And I did the same thing with uh, the, the Copper Scroll. And it, it went off the charts. And I don't know how the, the other guy did it, but I just searched the area that he had selected for me. It's between, uh, and do you have that available? And fell asleep on us. No, no, no. And you still there? Let's see if she, uh, she didn't drop out. There, I, I just couldn't unmute. I am here and I'm wide awake, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can, give me a minute and I will. Um, that's the table that the other fellow found for you yes. on? sure okay i'll look for that jim did yeah. you were you aware that um the temple institute is is making preparations with the red red heifers right now that um that they are they're this close to getting ready for preparation to to um uh what is that called when they when they use the red heifers ashes to uh the dedication of the temple no not the dedication um consecration the, consecration yes yeah, it has to be cleansed. Uh, that cave that I was telling you about, right? I promise you, if I'm right, that there really is a cave there, that inside of that cave will be the halal. You know what the halal is? That's the container for the ashes of the red heifer. Wow. I spoke with the lead people. I, I've spoken to the Sanhedrin, and I've spoken to the lead people of the Temple Mount Faithful and the Temple Institute, and they are all in agreement with me. So they are very well aware of the project. They're very excited about the project. 
but how are you, how are you received by these scholars there in in Israel, brother? Uh, I'm 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 assuming that you you're not Jewish or or part Jewish or anything. You're you're goy, right? Yeah, I'm I'm would be considered goy. So uh, how how did they how how was the reception of your information from a go, quote goy? Uh, how did they receive that? Well, the first. Uh, whenever I, I'm not going to give you his name because I promised I would, and I'll, I will tell uh, <clears throat> one of you at some point. So you can check me on this. I don't want to, I don't want you to think I'm making up stories, but I sat with a rabbi and that rabbi was very resistant of me. He even stood up and he, when he stood up, he, and I was a Nazir at the time. So I had really long hair and my buddy had long hair and he stood up and he pulled his the black coat, he had the peyote, the curly cues on the side of his head, and he pulled his jacket back so I could see the 45 revolver that was in his waistband. Oh my God. Other, yeah, he didn't trust us. And I don't, I, I got no problem with that. I, I understand. Christians have done some incredible damage to our re relationship with Judah. That's just fact. right. I've well, that many times. So he was very, very resistant at first until I got to the location number four. Remember the double entry mikvah? Yes. I got to that location. I was disclosing a portion of my research to him and the man stood up, walked around the table and he grabbed my shoulders and he lifted up on me and he kissed me on both cheeks. He said, do you realize what this means? And I said, well, yeah, it means the same thing to my people. And uh, he was beside himself. He knows. They knew. So the resistance was there. Each time I spoke with a, uh, a group, the resistance was always there. But you know what? When you show them the data and it's so easy, it's not something complicated. It, and it's so easy to understand. Yeah, they know. Matter of fact, uh, Moshe Faglin, you ever heard of him? Say that again. Moshe Faglin. Moshe Faglin. Um, that sounds he was very a, familiar. At the time that I that uh, <clears throat> we met, I showed him. I convinced him right uh, right away. He planned to meet me in Israel. We met a month later. He went with me out. He was the deputy speaker of the Knesset. Wow. He went with me out to Qumran. He he operated the buttons. I told him what to do and how how to do it as we walked. That's how we got the scans. Otherwise, if we'd have done it, it had been illegal. But he said, I could do it. He said, they can't do anything to me. I have diplomatic immunity. And I said, okay. So we went out there, we scanned it. That's how I wound up with those beautiful scans. And you only saw one of out of five, four scans yeah. that we did. This is so yeah. exciting. Yes, ma'am. I did find the table, so would you be able to stop share, and then I will share that Bible code. Sure. Hold on just a second. There you go. Thank you. Okay, there you go. Now, do you have the, a list of the terms that the fellow gave you? Um, yep, I think I do. Give so, me Anne, have you reconstructed a table? Yes. Okay, we did good. this about a year and a half ago, right, Jim? And uh, he sent me a list of the terms, and so I reconstructed it, but I didn't. I did not annotate it. Okay. Um, awesome. That that can be done um, in the future if um, Jim wants. But this, it's yeah. all scattered. You can read some of them. Some of them that are close together, like um, I see silver is right there. Um, Here's what I have. Sure. I have a. I, uh, here's what happened. Real quick, I was getting ready to do a presentation in Arkansas. This guy comes to me. He hands it to me. He said, "Mr. Barfield, I did a a, a Bible code on it," and he came up with 33 um, terms. And they were all between Exodus 10.4 and Exodus 10.27. And they start with, uh, and God told them to let the people go. And it ends with, and Pharaoh would not let the people go, like bookends. Yeah. 
But in there, I found 66, 33. He gave me 33, and I found 33 more. And they're all related to the Copper Scroll and to the Tabernacle. Uh, it's it's incredible. It's even got the day. It says Copper Scroll, first of Tibet was the day that I made the discovery. Nazarite. I was a Nazarite at the time. Uh, it gives the year of the excavation, fifty seven sixty nine, and the guy that was the archaeologist. It gives his name, Pele. Now this guy that did this had no idea. As a matter of fact, we hadn't even done the excavation at that point. So he, how would he know? to plug this stuff in there. That's what's so incredible about it. I, anyway, now, Ann, I'll let you have it and take it from there. Well, I don't have this annotated, but I know, I know that this is um, copper right here. There, that was uh, his access term, wasn't it? Copper scroll. So, pardon me? That's the mm -hmm. word. Right there. Yeah, that's it. Who can read? Let's test the, the, the class, see if they can read some words here. Arun. There's a uh, arc right there in arc. the circle. Mm -hmm. I see Shema. Where is it? What color? I see Messiah, Mashiach. Great word search puzzle. We should put this out as a there you go. puzzle book. You know, and I, there, there was somebody that commented on one of the videos yesterday about, I don't get it. It looks like a glorified uh, crossword puzzle. <laughs> and I, I, I just kind of like, you know, it's a reflection. If, if I can't convey to the viewer the, the complexities of codes and the depths of, of the Father, um, to the point where the, the comparison is like a word puzzle, and that's as far as I go, I feel like, man, I failed somewhere that I can't convey to you that, that this, is, this is not a word puzzle. This is so complex. I mean, we're talking about details that have been preserved in a, in a, in a text for thousands of years, sometimes modern terms, how is that possible? It's, it's, it's crazy. And it tells me that there is a divine hand involved. I love to, to show codes to atheists in, in uh, getting debates with, with folks like that, because in, in, in the sense of mathematics and science, you can't escape, you know, the, the numbers. When we're looking at codes that are one in trillions and the mathematics is saying, nah, this is not an accident. There's just, there's just too much to this, right? How do you convey that to a person on a rudimentary level and get him to, to walk away with an understanding of this is, this is, this is the most high. And, and by the way, Jim, we, we, we talk, we, we say the name of the father. We don't get into how you pronounce Yehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh. We just know that the name is important and it should have never been erased from the scriptures mm -hmm. um, and replaced with Lord and God. Um, but yeah, um, this is some heavy stuff with. Uh, it is heavy. It's some very strong bad. implications. I mean, like I said before, you know, the treasure is not really the actual gold and silver, even though that's, you know, precious no. metals are. are valuable the treasure is is the journey is the is you know jim's journey in this whole thing um it's very similar to ron wyatt um to be chosen as the vessel to get the information is, is such an honor and to share it with us uh, brother thank first of all thank you for for opening your research to us as researchers and uh, some of us are you know, have a different interest in, in different fields of research, we can appreciate um, your work and your due diligence in, in your field. Um, it's stunning and it's awesome. I was, you know, I was looking for the word because it is stunning. It I is. mean, to, to sit and to ponder and looking at this scroll and to know that, wow, 
almost 3,000, you know, 2,000 and some change, a handful of guys wrote this scroll and under tremendous pressure, right? Because there, there, were, there were three uh, waves of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar coming in. It was, it, it was three, um, three times he came up on the city with his armies. Anyway, uh, they must have been under tremendous pressure and uh, distress to get this done. I mean, how did they move so much weight is like 12 miles to no wait let me explain that that's that's what people think that's not what happened okay they, didn't do it. they here's why it's because and i i've only touched the tip of the iceberg there is a building there it has got walls like 12 feet thick and it it's shaped like a pyramid uh, the with the top of ha top half of it cut off, and, and I'm not to saying it was a pyramid, but I'm saying it was it was very thick walls. That was the treasury that they're talking about. There were more than one treasury, and the treasury that that uh, whenever they say we took these items from the treasury, it was right there within from the where that 900 talents of gold. Yeah, it's probably uh 70 feet, 100 feet maybe. Okay, so they didn't. So they didn't have this in Jerusalem. The, the treasury was actually in Qumran the whole time. Yes, it was in Qumran the whole time. They brought the tabernacle, and in Second Maccabees, it tells you in that cave that we're talking about. They brought the tabernacle of Moses, put it inside the cave, well, along with all of the implements that go with it, including guess what? The Ark of the Covenant. Somebody, I saw a note pop up on there. Wonder if Jim knows anything about the Ark of the Covenant. Guys, if Second Maccabees is correct, if if uh Emek Hamelek is correct, if the marble tablets are correct, and if I'm correct about that being the cave, I know where all the stuff's at. I know exactly where it's at. You know, a lot and, of Christians just assume that by the time of Yeshua is on the scene that there's you know a legitimate operating high priest there's a there's a ephods involved there's the ark of the covenant but that wasn't so was it brother there was no mm -hmm. ark of the covenant when Yeshua was there it was hidden no there was no ark of the covenant it was it was locked up it was locked up by josiah uh, and they they hid it away because he was expecting just exactly what happened yeah. and jeremiah was the guy he was the guy in charge and uh, i can i can show you guys I, like I said, I only touch the tip of the iceberg. Y'all got a, a a good portion, but you only got the tip of it. Yeah. Wow. So Thank what is you. your personal opinion, Jim? Do you believe that the Ark is at Qumran, or do you Absolutely. think it was taken all the way to no. Mount Horeb? Uh -uh. Okay. I, think, I believe it's at Qumran. Or are you talking about uh, Mount... Uh, um, Sinai, but, Horeb, um, no, ne Nebo, Nebo, no, no. I here's what it says in Second Maccabees. The word there is uh, he was going thither. He was on his way to Mount Nebo. Well, the path that you take, matter of fact, the same path that they take for the to take the uh, Azazel goat. Guess where they pushed the Azazel goat at? It was at Qumran. So the same path that they took to, to, to get to Qumran, that, that distance is exactly what is prescribed in the Talmud, the distance from Jerusalem gate uh, or the temple gate to Qumran was exactly what they said it would be um, in Talmud. And if they took that same path, they had to walk right past the, the cave to, uh, to go on the way to Mount Nebo. That was the shortcut. Now, did Qumran used to have an, a different name, or has it always been Qumran? There is a probability that when you see in the in the uh, scripture about the city of salt, that they were talking about Qumran, uh, but I can't say for sure. Uh, oh, I can tell you this: that Anne, whenever she ran a Bible code on on me and Qumran, I'll let you tell them that, Anne. Well, I, it, it was so big that I had to break it into three pieces. Say, it, and, there were so many relevant terms. Yeah. Did, do, and, you wanna, do you want to bring it up and kind of show people that are watching this what, what, 
we're talking about, Ann? Well, I can. It's, it's up to, like, Jim, I know we just talked about you being here, you know, presenting and whatever for an hour. So we've been going way over that. Um, it's up to you how long you stay. You're not committed to, you know, stay to the bitter end. Sometimes we go on and on, but you're welcome to stay. I can show you a code. Um, there's an introductory one with some general information, uh, interesting information about Jim and his life. And then the second one is more about the uh, location of Jerusalem being a similar, um, like a smaller version, uh, sorry, Qumran being a smaller version of Jerusalem. And then the third one is more the political and spiritual implications of this yeah. whole Either thing. the first or the second, and I think will will be a, a great example of how we are using um, the technology with codes <laughs> as a, as a uh, resource and as a tool to, to validate or verify something. Um, it either is or is not. Um, you can do this unbiased, guys. There, there's no dog in the fight. It doesn't matter one way or the other, but when you, when you see the results, um, and the codes are usually re reflect something you know, pretty amazing. Um, the truth encoded is an amazing thing to see. Um, so we're dealing with facts, we're not poking, a, taking a shot in the dark, making some sort of prediction about the future, guys. We're taking facts and known knowledge and plugging into the codes, and we're getting this data back. So if Ann um, would like to share that a little bit. Um, Maybe not a full presentation, Ann, but just kind of give them a, a, a visual of what we're talking about. Sure, just give me one moment to pull it up. So I teach the students, uh, um, Jim, uh, how to find themselves in the codes because searching things like Yeshua codes or about yourself um, sharpens your skills as a searcher because you see what a, what a you see what facts look like. In other words, mm -hmm. we're not we're not we're not trying to scramble through a bunch of randomness. Um, you know, right. a lot of times this information <clears throat> will come up uh, as anomalies that are just not normal. Right angles, um, you know, sh multiple words and phrases sharing a letter at a central point. And when you go and look at that central point in the text, it's usually like relative to what you're looking at, uh, mm -hmm. uh, relevant to what you're looking at. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Um, in, in searching something about you, it's not, you know, taking a shot in the dark it, or guessing. We can take priori terms and put them in there. And it is what it is. The, the way it comes up or does not come up is, uh, is all from the father. It has not, so it's a misconception. Some critics say that we cut and paste these things and arrange it to, to make it say what we want to. And that is simply not how, that is not how the mechanics of these codes work. Um, <laughs> And that's why I say I have no dog in the fight. I, I don't pick and choose what appears. Um, it's either there or it's not there. I agree. All right, so it's still rendering in? Yeah, let me know. It should be coming up any second. Let me know when you can see it. And we haven't talked about the combination lock when you put the access term in and it reorders all the verses the way that Yahuwah yep. wants you to see them. Right, so with your access term, it's like a combination of lock. Each letter is sequentially, and we're not, we don't care about the code. It does, the codes do not care how you pronounce a word. It's sequence of letters, like a combination. Once you have that combination, uh, let's see, we're talking about Qumran, Barfield, Jerusalem. That's our, that's our combination to open this matrix. Once we open this matrix, we're now looking at a code table, okay? And many times, the code researcher who has found the table, unless it's something that's been researched, you know, by a lot of people, something that's very common, you are probably the first human eyes to ever lay eyes on it. And that's an amazing thing to me when, when we're searching code. So now you have your matrix with the subject is uh, Qumran, Barfield, Jerusalem. All right, sister, take it away. Okay, and uh, the astounding thing about this table is that the two terms I was initially looking for were Qumran and Barfield, um, because I did a copper scroll 
Bible code a, a year and a half ago or so. And it was general about the Copper Scroll. And um, several people asked me, well, did you find Jim Barfield's name in there? <laughs> and uh, he was not because I hadn't read his book at that time. It was before the book came out, but I had listened to him on YouTube because I was reading through the Dead Sea Scrolls and I came to the Copper Scroll and then I'm going, oh, I want to look up YouTubes on it. And uh, so that's when I came across uh, his talks. And uh, so Kuman and Barfield are both the exact same skip. So here in the red going up in the oval, and then he's here in the blue going down. Right. Now it's a giant. I want to mark that um, so that the viewers skip, can but see. But that Yahuwah can do anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> now this, Jim, is simply astounding. Mm. Just the anomaly of your name and Qumran <clears throat> appearing vertically encoded that alone speaks volumes, brother. The, 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 that happening, the, the odds of that happening are in the millions, first of all. Um, we, we're talking about something that's, that's not just going to happen. It's not an accident that his name and Qumran are literally what? Ten, ten, ten rows apart? Something I'm just estimating. That's incredible proximity. And so Barfield, Qumran are next to each other vertical. And I was look, looking through the, the whole Tanakh, and uh, I was doing it incrementally um, by, by, by numbers. And the numbers were getting so big that I thought I was, I was too away from being done with it, just saying, and I'm not looking anymore, because see how narrow it is? It's only 10 uh, rows wide, because it stretched out so far. Yeah. And uh, I was just too away from being done with it, guys. And then like I can search for the two terms. This shows up on keys to the Bible program. It does not show up on Torasoft because of little differences in the manuscripts. Okay. Yeah. So if it's you look for this you. on Torasoft, you're not going to find it. Um, so yeah. So then the screen opened up and here's Qumran and Barfield and my jaw just dropped. Like, cause the other tables I was looking at earlier, they would have maybe a couple of letters in his name like Qumran would always show up because that was my initial search. But never did I have the whole word Barfield show up anywhere in the table. So this is the only one unless there's something further on from that, that term. But I'm not looking any further. I'm happy with the results here. <laughs> um, I think so we it. also I have, I think you I think yeah, who I revealed it. it. It's a gift right here. So, um, Jim, as uh, a career, was a firefighter and an um, arson investigator. Here is firefighting in this orange color going up diagonal, uh, sorry, diagonal. And uh, a couple of words flanking it on either side kind of describe Jim, noble, benevolent, also philanthropist is, is a meaning of that, uh, a definition of that. And then on this other side, but coming down, is herald or forerunner. It can mean announcer of good news or harbinger. So he's been doing this for 13 years, guys. He had this revelation like a long time ago. And if he doesn't have a gift of, you know, um, perseverance and long suffering, I don't know who does to have this information and to have to wait. You know? Okay, so I'm um, um, just going to rhyme, rhyme these off. Uh, these are their treasures from the temple. Um, let's see. Okay, copper is here. Now I don't know. Yeah, it is. Okay, so copper is right here in the plain text of scripture. And Jerusalem is in another verse here. So that's very cool because I really wanted Jerusalem to be in the table, but I had no control over that, guys. Once Qumran and Burfield showed up, there was Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's another gift. Um, the righteous is here. That can have multiple applications. Um, <clears throat> it can be Jim. It can be Yeshua. Like the Messiah is right here in this mov, Mashiach. And, you know, he'd be touching Jerusalem. You know, King of Salem. King of Jerusalem. Um, here is covenant going up here greet and it's also here going up and they're sharing the ta 
and ta means a sign. And to me, they're pointing like an arrow to this top line, which holds the arc here, a rune going across this way. And you put the hay on the end, and that's the fellow Aruna, the Jebusite, who King David bought uh, the threshing floor from, knowing that that would be where the future temple would be. Um, uh, this is Semitism, which is the opposite of anti-Semitism. It's someone who loves the, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, and so that describes Jim to a T. Also, believer. He's a believer. Um, Mamun. I don't know how to say that properly. And it's crossing over Elohim. He believes in Elohim. And Elohim is the exact same skip as firefighter. We're not saying that he's a, an Elohim. We're just saying that <laughs> that's interesting. It's the same skip. He believes you know, in Elohim. Let me just say this. With, um, with Elohim is a very broadly used word in Hebrew because mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it can have a, you know, a meaning of gods, right? But also messenger, right? So it is not okay. limited to an angel or to Yahuwah. An Elohim can be used in the sense of a human being as Yahuwah's messenger, even coming in his name, right? Oh, very good. So, um, firefighter and Elohim, same skip. I mean, that's 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 oh. saying something. That's good. Now, here in the plain text of Scripture, it does specify who this Elohim is. Here, I don't know if you can see that clear enough, but it's Yahuwah Elo Elohai Israel. It's yeah. Yahuwah the God of Israel. Okay, right. that's being specific about what Elo Hi we're talking about. That's right. Um, let's see. And Israel is here twice, actually, in the plain text. Um, now, copper, I, I told you, was here in the orange. In the same line is the word for map, mem. It's only three letters long, but I highlighted it because it was in the same line. So you got mem copper map hey. in one line. Incredible. Hey. Yeah. Uh, uh, what else do we have here? In the top line, the same line as Ark, there is sharing the Aleph with Elohim is truth. And he is the truth. Yeshua is the truth, right? His Amen. word is truth. So here is Aleph, uh, Mem. What do we get next? Yod, Ta, He. That's truth. Also, we have evidence and proof in the same line here in the green. So one day, our, you know, we're going to, the world will see the ark, and that will be the proof, and the, even the treasures here. Moriah is here twice in the exact same line. Let's see, here, um, Mem, let's see now. Hang on, sorry, I don't know have my cheat notes. Okay, it's it's stretched out here. Mem, resh, how, how do you spell that? Mem, resh, yeah. Yod, hey, and then it's here, small. Mem, where is it? Moriah. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Mem, resh, yod, hey. So it's within itself, and that it's that's Mount Moriah, where the temple is. Who's that? Hebrew is here twice, crossing over our field, and then it's also here, crossing over here. And that's the adjective Hebrew. So the Copper Scroll was written in Hebrew. So I th think, uh, yeah, Jim, you mentioned Dead Sea. It's right here. There's Yom, okay, two letters, but then in the rest of the line, but going the opposite way, there is salt. And that was the name of, of the sea in the Bible, Salt Sea. Mm -hmm. Ambition or calling, mm -hmm. this, this is what he's done, like I said, for 13 years. And it's crossing over, herald or forerunner. This is his calling. Shin, Aleph, Yod, Pei, Pei. And I think that's... Oh, repentance is so, so important. Oh, and Jeremiah is here. Okay, so... I'll show you Jeremiah and we'll end with repentance. Jeremiah is here, Yod, Resh, Mem, Yod, Hey. 
uh, in scripture can be spelled that way. Gosh, that's it tiny. can also have a, a vav on the end. And repentance is what Yahuwah is calling. If you guys listen to um, Rabbi so Glazer, yeah. every second table has repentance yeah. in it. There's repentance. And Yahuwah is calling his people to repent and come back to him. And that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Very good. So this is a very, very fat cylinder. So, so these scriptures are, are wrapped around a cylinder. So we're looking at, at a, essentially a, a roll, a magila of this. And she will have a huge margin down at the bottom of her matrix because it's a thin uh, ribbon of scripture. That's what we're looking at um, in her table is, is the amount of columns and um, rows in this is, is, is just a thin strip. So the fact that she finds all of these terms in a little thin strip of real estate in the, in the, the scriptures, guys, is phenomenal. It is, it is screaming a divine hand is involved, right? This, and by the way, you don't find information like this in Moby Dick and Gone with the Wind. There's a control text that we use, monkey text, to see um, you know, if you're going to do something in a scientific manner and test things, you have to have controls. Um, and this does not happen. <laughs> you don't find things like this. So this is how we know there's a divine hand involved. An all-knowing being, the Father, has put modern names, modern terms, and um, relevant terms to one another, all in this little thin strip. And she's got three versions of this because she couldn't get all of the terms in just one table, so she had to do it three times. That's, that's an overwhelming amount of, of data, and it, it's, it's incredible. So. And the, the third one uh, highlights the scriptures that are running through, and most of them are really relevant, um, yeah. especially two of them, super relevant. So, yeah. Okay. Considering all those data points, it's it's no question you've got a, uh, you've got an incredible um, code here. Yeah. Well, guys, I got to tell you, I've, I'm thoroughly impressed with what you what your team is putting together here. I I just I just loved what Ann showed me the, a few days ago, and and I look forward to to doing more with you guys. I'm I'm actually running out of time, and I'm I'm going to have to go, but I don't want to go. This is this is my thing. This is, yeah. you know, this is what I enjoy doing, is yeah, getting yeah. people that really truly believe in what they're doing, and are faithful to what they do. And I you've all impressed me so much, and and. What what is Ann doing? Oh, you get the book. book. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys be sure and go and get the Copper Scroll Project book. It is a fascinating read. If you love if you love Yahuwah, if you love the truth of His Word, if you love archaeology, um, all those things uh, wrapped up in one. Yeah, Dead Sea Scrolls, <laughs> fascinating subject matter. Um, it is very fascinating. Yeah. Let us bless you with a prayer, brother, before you leave us. We want to thank you for, for you know, spending your time with us today. Tom is uh, very you valuable. Thank and you, thank, um, you. thank well, you for sharing that with us. Abba, Father, we're just so thankful with what you're doing in Jim's life. Father, we, we ask that you go with him in a special way, Father. There's no question you have, you have chosen him as a vessel of truth, Father, in these end times that you're going to bring forth some amazing things. And we just pray a special prayer of protection that you would send your angels to guide him, to, uh, to, to reveal those hidden things to him, Father, that he needs to put these uh, puzzle pieces together, Father. Keep him protected from the enemy and the slander of the enemy, those that may come against him in his work to try to prevent him from proving. This is proof of you, Father. It, 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 it shows a divine hand, just like the codes. And so we ask that you... That you uh, You've given him a, a double portion anointing, Father, in this work. And, and may your will be done. Uh, and may you be glorified. And may everyone praise your holy name. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 I love you, brother. Thank you, Jim. Amen. To all of you. <laughs> praise Yahuwah. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was absolutely my pleasure. And you guys want to pick a day? Uh, I'm kind of stuck at home right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> You guys pick a day and uh, let's Ann, let's try to figure this out and I'll come back on. I've already sent the timeline to Ann, so it's 
it's on her shoulders now so she can get it to you guys and i hope you enjoy it and i'd love to come back on and teach you how to uh, how to get the most out of it so just Absolutely. let me know and i'll i'll join you guys so have a wonderful evening thank you so much for allowing me to come visit with you yes sir thank you so much thank you Jim. bye you're welcome Wow, and I am so uh, thankful you got that worked out. To uh, yeah. and that by the way, Ann awesome. was the one who facilitated <laughs> this and got this set up to where uh, Jim can join us today. And uh, what a what a what a blessing! That's just wow, amazing. what a gift! Yeah, yeah. yeah. For such a time as this, like wow, wow, Ann. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Ann. Well, it's my first rodeo. <laughs> oh, easy on me. <laughs> Thanks, oh. Jonathan, for facilitating it because i wanted Absolutely. you to <laughs> thank you, know, you um it's just fascinating if i mean it's another field it's similar to what we're doing but not it's an actual um archaeology uh, what we're doing is more biblical archaeology right where we're searching we're, we're digging into the word to, for the for the treasure um yeah, so uh, th this is just a part of the times that we're in, guys, that um, the, the, the Elohim that we serve is a mighty one. He proves himself, right? Just, he proves himself in many ways. Um, and as you see in his word that he quite often says, you know, I, when I do this, it is so that you know, or they will know that I am Yahuwah, right? So he he proves himself, and I think that's why uh, in, in these last days, a lot of this is going to come come forward. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, all these things that prove the Bible, um, are gonna are gonna be available for people to consider, um, especially now in this time of shaking, this Jacob's trouble that we're in. It's not a time of punishment, guys. It's a time to to wake people up and get their attention and get their house in order. All right, so. Uh, and I don't know if, if you guys have kept up with what Netanyahu is doing, but a week before the election, uh, I think it was November or December, I forget the time frame, but he said that he wanted to annex the Jordan Valley and the land west of the Dead Sea. This is right where Qumran is. Yeah. Can you see that he's into this? Like, I think he knows. Yeah. And they, he you see it's jordanian type territory in that area so if they do it at the wrong time israel won't have the complete ownership of these treasures and they belong to israel yeah you know so it could start a war right. if, if they do it at the wrong oh, yeah. time it could start a war with the muslims um because jordan will jump all over it it's our treasure it belongs to the state of jordan yada 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 yeah so i, I they're being very smart about it and i do believe Netanyahu absolutely knows. He's not one who's who's in the dark about things like this. Um, he he is a believer. Uh, if we if this was Rabin, in other words, Rabin wasn't a believer. He was an agnostic, and uh, probably wouldn't have cared about um, the the temple because there's no temple anymore, and he wasn't really for building a third temple. Right. Uh, this is the national identity uh, of the nation is the temple. Um, that's what they look at it as. Um, right now, the, the, the state symbol is the menorah. They would love it to be the temple. And so um, Netanyahu is for that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I believe he's well aware of this. And it's probably a strategic move that they annex so that they can recover this uh, for, for Israel. Because it's not about, it's really not about the money involved in it. It's really it's it's like it's like finding more you know uh coins of david's kingdom uh in the area that is supposed that david kingdom uh, existed and therefore is an a agri uh, excuse me an archaeological evidence a proof that this is not a myth because there are palestinians folks who say david never existed it's all legend right there was never a hezekiah it's, it's legend israel did not exist we lived here. That's what they say. And it's you know what? Lies, there's no, right? there's no right. tourists over there right now. Nobody yep. in the way of digging. 
Who knows? Only you know. Even though, even though the uh, Star of David is on top of the mosque. Yeah. The Al-Aqsa Mosque. Is that hysterical? <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, very tall. Who put it there, the Muslims or? or? Oh, no, no. It was, it was not the Muslims to begin with. Okay. It's, it's, almost very, like, very it's almost like someone being adopted and finding their, their real family and, and all of a sudden having um, validity to their life and yeah. just, you know, becoming whole. Yes. Amen. Has anybody got codes? What? But that's before, good. While we're still in class, I, I do. You want to share? Sure. Oh yay! <laughs> right. It's hard to follow that, but here we go. This is a completely different topic. Um, my access term. Okay, first I want to tell you how I got this access term. So, after our last class, I called my son in Florida because. I think I put it up what happened but on Discord, but I he always loves astronomy and he knows the names of many stars and all this stuff and constellations. So I just said, I think there's something bright coming soon. And he goes, What is it? What is it? I, I was so tired I couldn't think of it. So I, I couldn't think of it. And so the next morning I got up and then I searched around the internet and I found it. And it was this comet that's supposed to be seen in the next month uh, with the naked eye by the end of May. Uh, you can see it with telescopes right now, and it's called Atlas, Comet Atlas. Well, I did some more research, and this Atlas is a group, it's a, like it has an acronym, and there's about 10 different comets that fall under this Atlas section. And this one, oddly enough, is called C19 because they found it last year at the end of the year in 2019, but it's called C19, which I thought was kind of amusing. So my access term starts with this shin right here, and it is comet, and then it's the year 5780. So that kind of puts us like right now. And um, so Atlas is over here in this powder blue. And um, this all, this is, um, I searched the, I searched the prophets and it came up one time at a negative 1921, and it all takes place in the book of Ezekiel. Um, so, okay. So we have Atlas, and then this little word right here. I just tried to add myself um, what 19 would be. So I have um, Yotet. I think that I did that right, Yotet like 10 and nine. Um, Judah is in the medium blue, which is right here. Yehuda going there and starting with this yod and going across Yehuda, this dalit right here in the hay. So that's there twice. Jerusalem is in the plain text in the lime green once there and down here. Um, Nibiru is in the black. It's here, um, was actually here four times, uh, going straight across right there, the shortest form of it. Uh, noon, Bet, Resh, Wa, coming down. And then, let's see. Oh, I can't show you because I can't move it. Um, wormwood is in this medium green right here. And it's going down this way twice. Um, the word famine is in this pea green right here, this kind of fatigue green. Then it's coming up one time here into the axis term. Um, uh, Debar is in the uh, plain text in this uh, re cherry red here. Uh, it's um, 
that right? Let's see the bar. And then um, let's see what we else we have here. Okay, and then in the bright yellow we have Kikub. Again, I showed that in my last table for star or planet. And then um, in the burgundy, I was trying to see if the time frame would coincide. So I looked up the words for the second in the month. The word second is here twice crossing each other in this burgundy. Um, hey, Shin, Noon, Yod. Uh, and then it goes right across. Hey, Shin, Noon, Yod. And um, in the gray, one time right here is Hey, Chet, Dalit Shin starts right. Hey, Het Dalit Shin, and it is so. It's in other words, it's the second the month, the second month between the purple and the gray. Um, and then um, the pale yellow, right up here. It's one and two. And I think it goes one more time down here is, I was looking up remnant, um, but the spelling that showed up was Shin Rash Yod Dalit, which is Sari, but it actually, instead of actual remnant, it means survivors, survivor. Uh, it's in related, it just has a couple of letters different than the true remnant, which would be Shin Aleph. Um, Resh Yod Ta. So this one was just a little bit different. Now at the end, I found, okay, well, and this orange is I am Yahuwah, Ani Yahuwah. And um, let's see, the white here going through the bottom of the axis term, Shin Bet Bet is a word that means a splinter or fragment, but it can also mean chisel or was chastised. Uh, so when you see the scriptures that this all is over, you can see that it is Yahuwah's judgment also. And this purple right here in the plain text is, um, the text uses the word contem. I didn't know what that means, so I looked it up and it actually means uh, one rejecting. Um, and this extension right here, nun yod, nun yod lamed, is a word that means bluish or indigo or a de derived spelling means shine. So I thought that kind of went with comet. And, um, oh, and then this word right here, I was looking for extensions. So when it goes up, yod, ayin, resh, it means forest or wood. Oops. I'll have to put that in later. Uh, or to turn land into forest. But then when you come down the resh, ayin, yod, it means pasture. I just want to show you, um, read a couple parts of uh, Ezekiel here. And pretty much it's the same theme. Um, oh, let me go the other way. 2115. Um, Son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith Yahuwah, say, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. It is furbished that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth? It contemneth or rejects the rod of my son as every tree. And he hath given it to be furbished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened and it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer. Cry and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people. It shall be upon all the princes of Israel. Terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people. 
Smite therefore upon thy thigh. Um, let me see where else. By the way, guys, you can find. All right, so Ezekiel's talking about in, in chapter 21, these two swords, and, and, and it's, a, it's a visual, prophetic visual, uh, something that you can see. If you go to Google and, and put in Saddam Hussein cross swords, you'll pull up what uh, Ezekiel is prophesying in the ex specific location that, that he's talking about, even the direction of the sword when he starts saying, one way have the sword go one way pointing to Jerusalem and the other one pointing to a mom I think it is those swords are crossing and it's at the very location in Babylon at right. the at the mouth of the city at the at the entrance of the city every it's I mean it's verbatim if you go and google that you will see a, a visual representation a manifestation of um, what Ezekiel prophesied and not only that those swords are made from the weapons, just like the prophet prophesies, fashion the swords from the weapons. That's exactly what Saddam Hussein did. Two million people died in the bat and those battles between Iraq and Iran, and the, the soldiers' helmets and their weapons were used to form this monument. Hmm. I mean, it's it's verbatim what Ezekiel said. So if you'd say oh, prophecy never happened. One chapter of Ezekiel can be can be seen manifested in the exact spot prophesied in that one um, that one monument. It's incredible. If you're a lover of prophecy, I would I would encourage you read all of chapter twenty one of Ezekiel and then look at those cross swords. It's incredible. I remember those swords during that yeah. war. Yeah. So here in. Um, uh, verse 16 or chapter 16 26 uh, where this whole line right here is you can see all how many words are involved in this these two lines here thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians thy neighbors great of flesh and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger behold therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee and have diminished thy ordinary food and deliver thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd ways. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Um, so, if you just read, this whole thing is between Ezekiel 10.19 to 39.17. So I, I just thought that was interesting because they say this, um, this uh, comet called Atlas is, um, we might be able to see it with the naked eye by the end of May. And I think with binoculars by the, maybe the beginning of May and they're seeing it with telescopes right now, it'll be seen in the north sky. Um, like when you see the Big Dipper, it'll be like off the cup of the Big Dipper North, like where the North Star is, um, that direction. And I looked up on that, um, when I was researching about this Comet Atlas, it said that um, you can go to the website Sky, The Sky Live, and you can put in your location to see when you would be able to see it. So I put in where my son is in Palm Beach and where we are in Wilmington, North Carolina, pretty much. Um, it has certain locations, so you pick your closest one. And it, it said, like Jonathan, maybe you can help me here if this would be correct. It said like uh, the hour, it's military time, 23, like 34. So I figured that would be 1130 at night, right? Yes. And then until like 930, it didn't give up AM or PM, but by 2300, I figured that. Mm -hmm. And then to like nine, 9.30 in the morning for me. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And just when that year showed up, I tried different years. I tried different months to see if like the third or the fourth month were in here. Um, and I think, I, I thought I put a beeb in here. Maybe I didn't, maybe that's my previous table, but um. 
So there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. And, and a very small skip too. 1921. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, and only one time in the in the prophets. I should go back and do and see if it's in the whole Bible now, maybe, or just like I didn't check the, just the Torah or just I just checked prophets and that came up, so I went with it. Why? Anybody else got codes they want to share? Thank you, Paula. That was fascinating. Mm, my joy to do. <laughs> mm, mm. Anybody else working on anything? Okay, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna close it here so I can get this uploaded. Um, you might want to put this on. I mean, there's so much good information there. I want to share that with, with YouTube. Um, feel free to stay if you, you can like. Are you able to cut out the little bit of um, information that he was showing uh, about the maps? I think he was hesitant about sharing that part. Yeah, with I can. Um, I can. Yeah, we can probably edit that. So it'll take a little more time before it gets put up, but. Yeah, just where he was pinpointing the locations, yeah. you know, with those big red dots and that. I think that's we'll what it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me pray for you guys. Don't you don't have to leave? Feel free to, to stay and tell us what you like. Um, I got to continue on and get uh, some stuff done. We got uh, Passover coming in very quickly and. Uh, we, we got some things to do. Uh, we will be broadcasting and sharing some stuff with you guys. So please join us if you um, if you're able. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you then. Do you have any idea what time you guys will be it's starting? Five, around? Yeah, I think we'll we'll go for somewhere around five o'clock Hawaii time, and uh, okay. and we'll start. You know, I'll, I'll turn on the uh, the live stream. It'll probably be in our galley. Um, it'll probably be up front um, with all the cooking and stuff, just sort of like we did last year. Um, okay. We kind of involved everyone with what was happening with our family, and I uh, walked around with a camera and you know just trying to make it more uh, interactive for you guys, and especially for those who are, who are alone and, and you know they're not participating in anything. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I wish you all were here. Um, and those of you going to to Migos, be very careful when you're traveling and. Uh, and those kinds of things. I, I think uh, Scott's trying to get to Migos for Passover. All right, let me pray for you guys and we'll see you in the next meeting. Abba Father, we're so thankful. For what, what you're doing in this in these last days, Father, with our with our students and with the, with everyone in the body, Father, that you are pouring out your spirit upon all flesh. And we just thank you for that, Father, that you haven't left us in these distressful times i will go with these duties this week and nurture them in your way continue to nurture them in your way and revealing yourself in in, in every page father um, we desire to walk close to you keep them safe keep them healthy if they're if they're downtrodden and depressed father bring them to a place of shalom and peace and um lift them up Lift them up out of that pit, Father, because there are people who are anxious and who are depressed at this time, uh, are, are clinging to you. I will keep them hidden from the enemy. Let them, let them stay hidden, Father, in this time. Your word says, we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. Love you. Shalom. Shalom. Love you too. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. 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 Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, guys.